So hello, and this is the official welcome to the conversation on regenerative design. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be with everyone. Uh, see many familiar faces, lots of new faces. Uh, special shout out to Dominique for being up in the wee hours of the morning uh, to especially be with us. I know this, uh, we've got many different time zones of people calling in uh, from around the world and it's impossible to reach all the perfect time zones. So we, we appreciate all the flexibility this is definitely intended as a community space. So being here in person, obviously we will have a recording and we'll share that after, but being here in person is a large part of what we're trying to create around the communal experience. My name is Adam Lerner and I am the founder of Solvable. And I am joined by my colleague and our coaching practice lead, Mae Bartlett from Solvable as well, who will be leading us through a embodiment exercise in just a few minutes. Uh, it's important uh, in our work that we continually honor and acknowledge the land that supports us and the cultures that we've been in relationship with, uh, the cultures that have been in relationship with this land for many thousands of years. So I sit in what is now known as Vancouver, British Columbia, which is the ancestral, unceded, and current lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Salatooth nations. The Solvable team is privileged to be holding this virtual space uh, for not only what is an important topic, which is regenerative design, but also perhaps the more significant act of, of building relationality between global communities and between each of us with the living systems that surround us. Our team considers these containers and holding change the most vital work we can do to support the cultural shifts needed for a transition into a different way of inhabiting the planet. That concept of transition, I think, will come up continually in our conversation today and is a, is a really important framing. We created the Container of New Works as a series, and there's eight different conversations that we've been having on regeneration, as uh, we consider them kind of eight dimensions of a prism, uh, specifically to celebrate important voices, build community, and to be able to shift and challenge our perspectives. Today, we, you will have the opportunity to be part of generative conversations, both through the chat and in dialogue with many others. We'll have two breakouts today uh, together, and we'll also be uh, have the uh, privilege of being in conversation with Arturo Escobar and uh, his colleague and co-author co uh, in the forthcoming book, uh, Mikhail Osterwal. Uh, I invite you to share the chat continually as a common space that we can use. We're a large group. Typically, we would have a group share back, but in this space, we've got we've got so many people. We need to use the chat effectively as a way as a way to really share what's resonating and coming up for you. Um, so just briefly, and then I'm going to turn it over to uh, Josie. Um, the topic of regenerative design is one that is very dear to me. Uh, I was initially drawn to the field of design about 20 years ago and see some of my colleagues as part of that early journey in design uh, inside of different agencies. And, and what drew me to it was the idea of world making. And at the time, I didn't realize how contextualized that concept was to my kind of colonized imagination and also the relationship to materiality. Uh, and the, the challenge that I think we sit with now, which I'm so excited about sharing in this space with so many others is how design can, instead of separating us from the, the living world, act, actually bring us into greater relationship. And I've been deeply inspired by Arturo Escobar's writing on this, uh, on the concept of the pluriverse, uh, where many worlds fit, and that really is an invitation for us to radicalize our imagination. We are doing each of these conversations uh, in partnership with other organizations that we deeply admire. And when conceiving of who the appropriate partner was going to be, we couldn't imagine a more fitting one to be doing this with than with the RSA. And so I would like to introduce, uh, calling from London, jo Josie Warden to share a little bit about, uh, about her work and, and the regeneration journey at the RSA. And thank you so much for uh, joining us, Josie. Thank you, Adam, and thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm really delighted to be here and we're really excited at the RSA to be part of this conversation. Um, so the RSA, we're a social change charity and we say that we unite people and ideas to work on the challenges of our time. Um, I think design is really in our DNA um, for probably long before it would have been called considered or called design. Um, so from our kind of beginnings of the 1750s, we ran probably what you'd call now open innovation challenges, which Kind of threw open challenges to the public 
um, to work on solutions for problems that were that the market wasn't fixing. So we um, were involved in the development of things like the lifeboats, um, public toilets in the UK, things that people were really needing but weren't being fulfilled currently. And then um, I guess moving into the 20th century, um, as the uh, design became more professionalised, um, we've been supporting industry and particularly emerging designers um, to to tackle and to, I guess challenging them to tackle social and environmental challenges as part of their work. And so I think as an organization and also for me personally, I, I originally trained as a textile designer, have been on a bit of a, a bit of a journey around um, seeing moving from design as product through to design as a way of thinking and as a way of being in the world. Um, and so and exploring increasingly kind of where that has come from historically and what that means for us in the kind of mindsets that we bring to this. And so currently um, I'm leading our work on regenerative design. So that's starting to bring together our practices in the organization um, and our networks that we're part of to, to think about what it means to design for regenerative futures and what are the kind of skills, capabilities that we need to be developing and learning as designers, but also as anyone working on these challenges. Um, so we yeah, are really, really delighted to be here. Thank you again. And we're looking forward to the conversation. Um, and I'm gonna hand over to May now, who's gonna do a centering exercise to kind of bring us into the space. Thanks, Josie. All right, I'm going to guide us through a meditation that is inspired by one of Thich Nhat Hanh's meditations that Arturo references in his work. So I invite you to get comfortable where you're sitting and go ahead and close your eyes if that feels comfortable for you. And just start by bringing your awareness to your breath. Notice the rise and fall of your chest with each inhale and exhale. Notice the impact the oxygen has on the rest of your body. Maybe allowing you to relax a little bit more, releasing any tension from your day. And as you tune into your inner world, I invite you to let the outside world go. Let go of your day up until this point. Imagine that the walls surrounding you melt away. And the other structures in your neighborhood and in your city disappear until there is nothing left but you and your chair in this moment. Thich Nhat Hanh asks us to actively contemplate the end of this civilization. The civilization that's rooted in growth and extraction and consumerism that has led to the many global problems we face and that will inevitably end like everything else, either through collapse or intentional change or likely a combination of both. And as you sit with this idea for a moment, as you breathe in, say to yourself, breathing in, I know this civilization is going to die. Breathing out, this civilization cannot escape dying. Breathing in, I know this civilization is going to die. Breathing out, this civilization cannot escape dying. <coughs> to breathe, uttering these words to yourself. Just notice the emotional responses that come up as you sit with this knowing. There's likely a part of you that is attached to our civilization, rightly so. There might be a part of you that sees possibility in a blank slate. See if you can connect with the possibility space around the idea of a new civilization, a new way of organizing ourselves in society.
come back to the feeling of your breath inside of your lungs. Come back to the present moment in your body in this space. Bringing this sense of possibility with you into the rest of our time together. And as you're ready, you can open your eyes and rejoin the group. And I will now turn it over to Josie and Arturo for their first conversation. Thanks very much, May. Yeah, thank you. I'm hoping in this conversation about design, we can start kind of exploring a bit about how design can help us let go of some of the things that we might need to, but also to explore the possibilities and the potential that for it to be able to kind of build up those new features too. Um, and so to have that conversation, I'm really delighted to introduce Arturo Escobar, who's Keenan Distinguished Professor of Anthropology at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Um, and over the last 30 years, he's worked closely with Afro-descendant environmental and feminist organizations in Colombia. Um, he's very well known for his work on development, um, but in the last few years as well, has been focusing a lot on the role of design. So um, the, the books including Design for the Pluriverse, uh, which we'll be talking a bit more about the content of today, um, but also a forthcoming book, um, Designing Relationally, Making and Restoring Life, which is writing with Priti Sharma and Mikhail Osterweil, who will be joining us a little bit later on. So thank you so much for joining us, Arturo. It's a real honor to have this time with you. Thanks so much, Josie, and thanks to Alan and May and Solvable and RSA and everybody who is here now for joining us. Great, so I think there's going to be a mix of people in this online space who probably consider themselves designers or design professionals and also people who are interested in the role of design and the kind of practice of design in a more everyday context. So I wonder if you could start with um, the kind of, I guess, the beginnings of design and what you consider design to be, if you could frame that for us, um, and also the role that you think it's played in shaping the world that we find ourselves in today. Okay, thanks Josie for that question. And Maybe a good place to start is with going back to Thich Nhat Hanh's meditation, wonderfully led into by, by May. And when May asked us to think about how the idea of a new civilization makes us feel, for me, what came up was the idea of a release, being released into a new kind of freedom, freedom to create a new reality, to create a new world. And I think that's one of the wonderful things that is happening today in the field of design, but that, that is, design is beginning to open up to that possibility, to that realization that things can be really, really different and should be really, really different. But let me start with the question of civilizational crisis. What is the context in which design fits today? And is the context in which everything else fits today, which is that we are undergoing what indigenous peoples in Latin America have been calling for about four decades already, a civilizational crisis, by which they mean a crisis of a particular mode of existence, heteropatriarchal, capitalist, um, anthropocentric, secular, and so forth. We'll talk a little bit about that later on as well. What is that crisis? Uh, and then that if we are within that crisis, uh, we can experience that also as a call, and this is again taking that hands call, for civilizational transitions. But how do we think about transitions? And in my view, one of the most powerful concepts that is re-emerging today for thinking about transition is the concept of interdependence. Some people have emphasized, including for instance, Charles Eisenstein and Daniel Christian Wall in his wonderful book, Designing Regenerative Cultures, have emphasized the need to shift from a story of separation to a story of interdependence or interbeing. We call in our, in our book that we're writing with Michal and with Kriti, we talked about shifting the story as well between that story of separation and dualism to a story of interdependence and relationality. And so that that relationality is really, is, is the actual foundation of life. That, that, that life doesn't operate as we think within the modern West on the basis of separation, separation between humans and non-humans, mind and body and so forth, but really on the basis of interdependence. So if we do that, everything 
that we really come to that realization, everything has to change. Uh, one more word about the civilizational crisis, one formulation that I like is from a Jamaican philosopher, Sylvia Winter. She talks about that we are all contained, increasingly contained, increasingly trapped within a mono-humanist notion of the human, a single view of the human as secular, liberal, bourgeois, individualistic, and so forth, that is starting in the West at the Renaissance, at the time of the Renaissance, and has become increasingly spread worldwide. So from monohumanism and monotechnologism, and even monorationalism, we have to move to something else that we are going to be calling the pluriverse. Uh, and that's the proposal that we are, and we many other people are trying to put forth. So the second uh, element in answering your question, Josie, is how has design, how is design changing? And this change has been going on for quite a while. Um, I just saw in passing that John Thakara or Thakara is in the audience. He's been one of the pioneers of some of these changes and he's been gaining, um, uh, uh, it's becoming more, more, more broad, this, these changes in, in design. And it's changing in the sense that uh, many designers are coming to, to the realization that design is becoming a very important domain for thinking about the making of life and the creation of worlds. Design is about world making, it's about life making. So that's why we say that design is ontological. We talk about the ontological, and then we have to uh, broach the question of how do we reorient design ontologically from being enmeshed as in being a political technology of modernity, being a really one of the central instruments and pillars of modernity, because design has been that, in it's been wedded to capitalism and functionalism and commercialism and so forth, to being a pillar for this transition towards the pluriverse based on the notion of interdependence. So, and, and there's a lot of, of work, I think, in design. We can talk a little bit more about that a bit later on today about how design is being reoriented. And that, and this is the last point that I want to make because our time is short, that why is design ontological? Why do we talk about ontology in relation to design? And the answer to that question to me is very simple. And I found originally in a book from 1986 already by Terry Winograd and Fernando Flores. It's a wonderful book, it's still worth reading called Understanding Computers and Cognition a new foundation for design. And in that book, they say that design is ontological because in creating tools, we're creating new ways of being, new ways of doing, new ways of knowing. So this is also the, another way of saying is that we create designs and those designs that we create also design us back. And Marie Willis and Tony Fry have been talking about that for quite some time, the double movement of design, design designs. So that also speaks to the ontological foundation of design. So it is very exciting, exciting what is happening about design. We'll talk a bit more about in what fields we can see that as being taking place more actively, uh, but let me leave it at that for now. Fantastic, thank you. I wonder if we could unpick a bit more this, the notion of the pluriverse and how design kind of can shape, as you say, opening up and releasing this sense of, of, di of different possibilities and what that might look like in terms of uh, the different world of idea of making, making worlds and different, different ways going forward. Yes, so we talked about two things already. We talked about uh, being contained within a single idea of the human, this mono-humanist idea of the human, and the way in which that view of the human has translated into the design world is by, we can call it a monoversal, not a universal, but a monoversal idea of design. Design has been this amazing force shaping uh, the making of the world in a very, uniform way, in a very homogeneous way. There is a great variety, there is great heterogeneity, but for the most part, uh, we can say that what the result of, especially five, the last 500 years, and even more so the result of the last 200 years of modernity has been this single world 
in which only one way of making life, one way of making the world fits. A world made of a single world. A world, not a world of many worlds, but a world, a world made of a single world. This is idea that goes back to British sociology, John Law. He has this wonderful piece called, and I put in the chat later on, what's wrong with a one world world? What's wrong with the idea that the world is a single globalized world according to the rules that is at the historical experience of the West, again, shaped and designed in terms of secularism, anthropocentrism, liberalism, capitalism, and so forth. So to shift from there to the idea that the world is many, that the world is composed of many different worlds, uh, there, is an over, there is an overarching reality, of course. We all share the pluriverse, we all share life, we all share the planet. But beyond that, there are multiple ways of making worlds, of constructing worlds. There are multiple worlds, multiple reals, multiple possibles. And that's what the idea of the pluriverse seeks to convey. So if the world is multiple, that means that we need to entertain that towards the future as well. And I know your work on, on regenerative futures very much consider this possibility that the worlds of the future will be different worlds, significantly in ontological terms. They will be about a different kind of human, about a different kind of making, about a different kind of doing, a different kind of knowing. So that's what we talked, uh, uh, when, what, what we mean when we talked about the pluriverse. Yeah, I think, as you said, we're really interested as well in that sense of how to how do we not talk about future, but futures, this idea that there will be lots of different ways of doing things and we don't know what they are yet or how they'll interact, but there is this kind of expansion from this single view of things. Um, and then I wonder within that, we're also, I guess, really interested in how, how people are involved in shaping those worlds themselves. And so there's the kind of, I mentioned at the beginning, the idea of design as a, as a profession and design as a kind of practice, but also design in the everyday and design as a way of people expressing themselves. Um, and you talk in your work about autonomous design and that kind of that shift too. So I wonder if you could ex explore a little bit more of that idea. Yes. So I think this, one of the things that I, the ways in which I like to think about it in terms of design is that design is emerging as a very interesting field, as already mentioned, which is centered on the making of life and the making of worlds. And it's doing so in many different ways, in the global north, in the global south, and there is an increasing conversation between those in the global north and those in the global south around what design is and the possibilities for design. So in the global north, for instance, we have transition design, design for transformative social innovation, we have just design, um, we have transition towns, which is a design strategy, we have many different ways in which this is happening in the global south. The emphasis is on decolonizing design, decolonial design, designs from the south, other than design, meaning by that, those things that people make that cannot be and shouldn't be uh, forced into the umbrella of design understood in the modern sense of the term. So it's a very rich moment. Uh, regenerative design comes into the scene, I, I believe, uh, in this context uh, about how, what does, and what does it mean for everyday life? And I think regenerative design is a good place to start because it involves so many aspects of design. And I know, for instance, that the, in the UK, there's a lot of critical thinking in fashion design, which I really, really like. I'm becoming more aware of that uh, in terms of bio design, in terms of uh, circular design, uh, bio-based textiles, and so forth. And all of these, I'm not saying that these are all perfect in the sense of pushing us towards the transition, towards a, a, a genuine, Redesign, redesign of the world in terms of interdependence, but that they are really good starting points for thinking further about all of these different fields. But in fields like commons and commoning, degrowth, transition towns, food sovereignty, almost anything having to do with food, in cities, re-earthing cities, biophilic design in urban situation, in urban context, obviously urban gardens, um, all of these uh, peasant markets, food markets, agriculture, all of these are instances in which the transition is already happening in the everyday life. And whether they are explained by people who are doing it in terms of design or not, the fact is that this, in our, in our view at least, this can be 
understood and interpreted as transition design practices and strategies. There's a lot of emphasis finally on uh, regeneration, re restoring, restoring, refashioning, repurposing, recycling, reusing. I call, sometimes I refer to that as the ensemble of the re's, all of these different re, regenerate, reuse, etc. And these are a sign of the times in the sense that they are response on the part of designers many times to the devastation and destruction and degradation and displacement caused by modern globalized development based on extraction and based on the destruction of, of natural resources and of people's uh, dignified lives. Yeah, I think that's that's a really nice expression of where the kind of designers are seeing that sort of shift and wanting to kind of express it in different ways and looking towards those futures. Um, it's been really good to talk to you and it's been really quick in this, in this part of the conversation, but we're gonna, we're gonna move into a breakout now and then cup up, come back and hear a bit more about the kind of axes and the ways of thinking about this and the ways that design can move forward. Um, and we're gonna build on some of the conversations that we um, have just had around this sense of um, dualism or separation versus maybe more relational and a pluriversal way of looking at things. And so we're gonna send you into breakout groups and we're gonna ask you to think about um, your day. So we're going to spend a couple of moments each thinking about your day, thinking maybe from when you wake up through to the evening and when you go to sleep. Um, and I am sort of noticing as you walk through your day where there is elements where separation or dualism is kind of coming into your world. And that could be thing across things like um, separation from nature, across gender or ethnicity or um, way, different ways of thinking and being, where are you seeing that sort of dualism and separation? Um, and also on the flip side of that, are you noticing moments where design or, or spaces are creating a space where you can think more relationally and more about those kind of multiple, multiple ways of thinking? And so we're gonna send you to this breakout, so you have a few minutes each, and then we'll come back into the main room. Okay, welcome back everyone. Uh, I hope that you had a, a fruitful breakout discussion. If there were any things that were really showing up for you in that discussion that were particular salience that you wanna share, please use the chat, given that we still uh, have approximately 100 people in this discussion. It would be, it would be great to uh, do it through chat as opposed to having the overall share. We will have another chance for breakouts and we will um, go ahead and mix up the group so you'll get to meet some other people. So I would like to now introduce uh, Arturo's co-author and who is the uh, Associate Professor of Global Studies at uh, UNC. Uh, Chapel Hill, Mikhail Osterweil. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you and excited to chat about uh, the convergence of your work together in the book that you and Arturo are co-authoring now. It seems like in the first part of the conversation, we were really setting the theoretical foundation for, for the pluriverse and um, laying out the ontological framework in which we can understand a different way of being and knowing of, of, of cognition. Um, I think that I can say, at least from my personal experience, this process of, of decolonizing and therefore also radicalizing our imaginations is a very difficult and long project. Uh, and so one of the things that we had talked about in planning this conversation was how we could use the second half to be able to talk about some of the more practical aspects of how we actually transition from this kind of singular monocultural uh, mindset, mindset that came through the uh, globalization, globalized lens into a, a multiple world, the pluriverse context. And so I was wondering if you would mind sharing, you can share whatever introduction, but we're gonna talk specifically about the six axes of, of transition that you guys have been formulating. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for having me and thank you um, yeah, for letting me participate in this conversation. I get really excited to talk about this work. I um, get to teach about this to students, but it's really exciting to be in a room of people that are practitioners in the world, really trying to like think about what it means to transition, taking pluriversality and the sort of onto like the ontological dimension seriously, seriously enough to then ask me this question of like, all right, so this isn't just a theoretical exercise, right? Um, this is a practical exercise and something I was sharing earlier is I think 
you know, I am still an academic <laughs> and I am doing research and writing about it. And part of the challenge, right, in this work that we have actually addressed many times with um, Arturo and Kriti Sharma, our other co-author, is the, the limits of the, con the world of concepts, right? Like concepts are wonderful, but they're tools, you know, and they help get us somewhere, but there's actually always a limit to them. And one thing that we're also really aware of is that relationality, non-dualism, part of a key principle of those of that for us is being able to hold contradictory truths and the idea that paradox, right? Paradox actually only exists in the conceptual realm, right? We live with paradox all the time. We live with like two truths all the time, actually in practice, right? And so that messy world of practice is actually more like where non-dualism and relationality can live. And it's very hard to write and then talk about them in a clean and linear way. So I just wanted to, to foreground. So yeah, um, Alan, Adam mentioned six axes and, you know, we've talked about six axes and there's one of the things about what we speak about is the political activation of relationality. I need to put my timer on because I tend to ramble. Um, sorry, let me do that real quick. Um, when we talk about the political activation of relationality, one of the things that is really challenging about it is that because we are coming from, uh, most of us at least are coming from the dominant Western universalist modernist worldview and ontology on the way to a politics of relationality, something we've watched a lot with social movements, projects, activists, is that there can be like, you walk along and you're in, you see the essence of relationality or what we're talking about with relationality. And then you find yourself back in that other worldview, right? And sometimes we talk about like walking in and out of those multiple times a day even, right? So we have tried to like distill certain principles or axes is what we're calling them of how to work on or projects that we see actually having success working at the level of relationality. But they are, because it's a non-dualist framework, they are very intertwined and sort of like each way you come in, you end up at another one. And they also follow certain principles. So before I talk about the six axes, I just want to say that they're premised on a principle of contingency, operating on a principle of emergence. And they are non-normative, right? So one of the things is like, it's very difficult to say this is a good way to do things. It's not about good or bad, right? It's about the way they work they practice, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, and so that's the last bit. It's referencing practice, not theory. So the six axes, and I'll name them and then I'll try to explain them. Um, and you hurry me along, please, if I'm not being clear or if I'm going too long. So, so the six axes are the recommunalization of social life. I'm going to read them all and then go back, okay? Recommunalization of social life, the relocalization of our activities, and the strengthening of autonomies, the depatriarchalization, deracialization, and decolonization of all social relations reintegration with the earth, and then building and expanding self-organizing meshworks of transformative alternatives. Okay, so again, these are all, they sounding pretty big still, right? And that's where I'm quite aware. <laughs> well, and just to, just to yeah. say before you dive into those six yeah. is that there, and we spoke about this with Arturo in, the, in planning this conversation, which is that the principles are inherently tied into a core philosophy around regeneration is that there is a, a, a re, you know, and many of them have a re aspect to them, um, which is the recontextualization of a lot of the work and relations uh, that, that we, that we are either distant from or, or some somewhat connected to, but as you said, not entirely. And so I do think that contextualizing these in the con in the within the conversation around regeneration actually provides a, a kind of umbrella that brings them all all together even though I think the way that both of you speak about uh, these axes and you know kind of the reframing civilization and transition is actually different and why we wanted to uh, really bring in your perspective compared to many of the regeneration conversations it's a different language but similar yeah. principles 
Yeah, and um, I should say that one of the places this project, this boot project actually started from was us noticing that there are what we see as the emergence of this relational worldview in popping up in all sorts of places that didn't necessarily use that language, but that was one of the like original aims of the book was actually to sort of do a collect like, to name those as sources of this new way of seeing and like look at where all the people are practicing and it ended up being more about the obstacles to transition and how to maybe find our ways out but hopefully the language yeah. So I mean one of the the overall guiding principle just to say like if you think about the first three which I want to talk about as a group and also speak to I'm going to try and keep track of the chat but that sometimes derails me so I might not do such a good job when we talk about communality territoriality and autonomy we are talking about sort of reclaiming the power over making life right and that might sound quite simple but it means um, shifting from sort of modern expert and institutional systems that provides standardized or passive services to people like food, health, education towards reclaiming the ability for life making in terms of, and this is something that we take from Gustavo Esteva or even Illich, his teacher, I can't actually remember who did it first, active verbs. So that you are an active agent in to eat, to learn, to heal, to dwell, to build and to create livelihoods, right? So when we talk about recommunalization, one of the things that we are very aware of is the ways in which the modern, ontology is makes us seem believe that we are individuals right so recommunalization means making it clear that we are not individuals right showing us all the places we are interdependent and also making like practices and structures and organizations in which we highlight that interdependence and cultivate like a positive relationship to that right because interdependence or being dependent on others in our culture can actually be seen as a weakness in some cases our argument is that ontologically you are dependent on all you know the web of life even if you think of yourself as a self-made man right like you're always depending on the people doing the housework the people doing you know teaching your kids like all the things that go into life like you are dependent on them you've just created this like box that sees you as an individual. So recommunalizing life is absolutely essential. It is also, and we'll get to it in a minute, part of depatriarchalizing, de deracializing, and decolonizing sort of liberal capitalist modernity in which the individual is such an important actor. Um, territory, territoriality, right, which is staying committed to place, which we want to recognize like can get um, critiqued for because local places can be the sites of very regressive kinds of practices right and we're not dismissing that fact we're not just romantically like hearkening back to some sort of like halcyon day in which the you know local was perfect but we are saying that even those difficult regressive practices can actually only be worked on really in place right with especially when you think about the logic of contingency meaning it's not that you're looking for this blueprint to tell you how you're going to organize in place. Place specific histories, place specific relations, the territory, like literally the natural air environment that you're in matter a great deal. And so- yeah. mm -hmm. Can I get a pause there just for a second and um, zoom in in terms of design practice, which I think, mm -hmm. I think when we talk about um, design in the context of these three principles, design is inherently contextual. And I think that anyone, um, that practices design is is you know you're you're trained to think about the context in which the the product or the built environment that you're creating is embedded within a system. You think about the users and how that manifests um, uh, context for them and builds relation. I'm really curious about how you see from the design perspective how designers uh, in practice broaden the relationship and the contextuality that you're talking about inside of you know these three ideas particularly like what does it mean in design practice and the things that you might be creating to uh, re recommunalize social life how is the how are the things in which you are putting out and in, in kind of contributing into world making therefore changing the social fabric and how do you yeah. think of how how might one think about the the project and the responsibility with each kind of aspect of what what somebody might be designing because i think at a citizen level in the civic level this is it, this is this is pretty clear but i think in the design practice i think it's um maybe a little more murky yes and 
as I mentioned earlier, design, Arturo is more the person plugged into the design practices side of this. And Arturo, if you want to, if you want to jump in here, I'm happy for you too. But one of the things that we think of in a design practices is like all of us are actually designing the world and being designed by the world, right? And so when we're thinking about education, about eating, about schooling, about health, right? Like these systems that at the moment you take yourself as an individual in the marketplace of these things, right? And you go, so design and, and our, our sources of inspiration tend to be radical social movements from in particular Latin America, because that's where Artur and I have worked, but also in general, the global South, because they have been less completely colonized by the forms of um, deterritorialization and expert systems. Sometimes some people would define that as the failure of development. We actually see a lot of wealth in that quote unquote failure, because we see people that are closer to systems that are inherently collective. And one of the things in design is and this is why I'll say re-communalizing, re it's like our point of departure as humans was communal. The commons actually precedes the private. You know, you have to enclose the commons for us to have private property. So in all the ways that we can highlight our communal interdependence, right? In the sense of like, for example, a space where people would go and play with their kids and there's like maybe a little herb. I mean, this sounds very cheesy, but it's powerful. Like an herb garden that has medicinal plants or a community garden, right? That's one way that we can think about it, but it's also like designing things that don't presume the self-made individual as the taker. I think the design of those things creates those or actually doesn't even create them, like shows us or calls in those people that aspect of themselves. So that would be my short answer to that. I don't know if Arturo, you have a more precise design answer to that. Well, maybe very quickly, what, one example that I usually give is, is to show the relationship between ways of being and ways of thinking and actual design outcomes, or between ontology and design, is in terms of spatial practices, the practices of dwelling. For instance, in the typical 1950s, 1950s, 1960s, suburban home in the US at least, in which every individual, every individual had their own, every family had their own home, the nuclear family, and every individual had their own room and the two car garage and everything else, which resulted in designs of subdivisions and condominiums of similar houses and isolated houses separated from each other. That's one particular model. And then traffic congestion and then decommunalized societies, de -individ very individualized, individu individualized societies, centered on consumption and so forth. If we take the opposite example, which is, this is very going to be very simplistic, the Amazonian longhouse called Maloca, which means the collective home, homes in which Amazonian indigenous peoples live, that sometimes 30 or 40 people can live in a single space, in a shared space, there you cannot have as an outcome, as a design outcome, the kinds of individuals and decommunalized societies that we have in the suburban case. There you have profoundly communal, relational, interdependent uh, ways of being, including connections with nature, with the ancestors, with the spirits, with food and so forth. So the design outcome is very, very different. We don't even have to say that one is better than the other, only that they are really different. They have different implications for how we treat each other and how we treat uh, the environment. Mm. And I think that goes Arturo, directly into what Michal was sharing originally too, is that um, the, con the, the very social conditions and the context that surround us are even indirectly very relational to the, the outputs of, of the processes um, in which we're designing. And it's something that we often take for granted. I mean, I, I think in a creative context, we think about that very deliberately about how we cultivate um, diversity in studio environments. And, um, but I do think that, <laughs> I think about somebody like, David Abrams' work around the relationship of, you know, talking yeah. about the shamans uh, and the relationship that the shamans were a connection point between worlds. And so they were a connection point intentionally put out of the context of a village 
into the forest, but they sat between the spiritual world and the world of that village. And in your comment about the suburban relationship as compared to say a contextual um, communal living, and we also have longhouses are very much part of indigenous culture here in, in the Pacific Northwest and Canada, um, that the, uh, that is very, the, the proximity uh, the geographic proximity is very significant in terms of the outputs of what actually happens from the creative process of, of design. Yeah, I'll, I'll speak to two more because I know we're about to end, but I just want to say like building on what you all said in terms of the bridges between, I think that's actually in terms of the six principles, we talked about mesh works, right? Transformative mesh works between. And I think that it's actually like, it's not just an extra thing, like you need all these ideas. I think the between place, and one of the things we have started to be more and more aware of, and this is a concept that Arturo and Marisol de la Cadena came up with, is this idea of pluriversal contact zones. So it's in those places where you see a world that's like, you don't fully, like you can't fully make sense of it in your worldview, right? Like you're never going to be like the indigenous person from um, Colombia that is being that way. But in that contact zone, you are seeing a lack or an inspiration to how you might remake yourself as a less westernized individual, right? And there's obviously potentials of romanticization, co like there, there's a lot of discussions to be had. But in that pluriversal contact zone, there's a lot of possibility. And then the last thing I just want to make sure because I saw someone speak about it, when we say autonomy, I should have actually written autonomia because autonomy is not liberal autonomy of the individual. Local autonomy projects have a very particular history in Latin America and in Europe and have inspired some cases in the United States, but they basically are at their heart collective, but they refuse to be defined by the dominant political structures of the nation state or otherwise, right? So one of the most famous cases of the, of the autonomy is the Zapatista movement in, um, in Southeast Mexico, in Chiapas. I don't know how many people are familiar with them, but um, they have articulated this idea of they're building local good governance. They're also building uh, hybrid health clinics that are both Western medicine and indigenous medicine. They are building um, food cooperatives that grow like the milpa, but also you know okay. other kinds of local food. So they are building a world, and they even say this, they say the, the, the world, that's too difficult to change, right? What we need to do is build new ones, or they actually say we need to build a world where many worlds fit. And so autonomy, the political counterpart sort of to recommunalization and re-territorialization of daily life is building forms of political autonomy, right? That like, it's not that we necessarily even have to like, <laughs> you know, in a political sense, take down the state and have the revolution, but rather like crowd out its hegemony and monopoly over our lives by building these other forms of power and of, of, of the power over making life, right? Again, like we have, we have seeded, we Western moderns have seeded so many areas where we had, ex, like we had power to make life rather than just consume life or, in how, you know, so I, I know we've run out of time, so I'm trying to be mindful of that. No, it's great. I mean, there. I think we'll um, we'll circle back, and that when everybody's in breakouts, I really appreciate all the questions. And there's some, they're looking, they're looking for a bit more clarity on meshworks, which we'll try to come back to when you're in conversation with Arturo. They're looking for. It seems like a little more discussion about uh, Chiapas and the autonomous okay. autonomous zones, which actually David Graeber has written about, and people were talking about Graeber here. Rebecca Solnit. There's lots of people, including yeah. you works um, have also talked about the importance uh, and I encourage those to actually go and read the primary sources of that's coming out of the Zapatista movement which are incredibly inspiring and poetic um, so we'll dive not that we can cover everything but we will try to circle back uh, to some of these uh, to some of these bigger questions when we come back from breakouts so we are going to have um, a breakout groups now. Uh, you'll be in breakouts for, for 15 minutes, and you're going to be with a different grouping this time. And the, the breakouts, and feel free to discuss what is really showing up for you, because obviously there's so much rich content that's been shared. The prompt that we'd also like to share, if you would like to discuss it, which is how could you start implementing one or multiple of these axes in your life and work? And what do you think would be the effects of doing so? So we are going to take a short 15 minute breakout and then we're gonna come back together for a conversation between Arturo and Cal, which will try to respond to some of this <laughs> and integrate it in the, in the work and uh, in a very short period of time. Uh, so have a, have a good breakout and we'll see you in about approximately 15 minutes. Thank you, welcome back. So 
I want to invite everyone to just take two minutes of quiet time so we won't talk and just share anything you learned, came up with in terms of applying these axes in your life, questions you're left with. And we'll just take two minutes to think and write and share in the chat, and then we'll continue our discussion together. Just two minutes if people wanna finish putting and then try to read. There's such beautiful things in the chat. I hope everyone has an opportunity to look at them. I'm struggling, so I wanna come back to you all too. Um, the app end was reentering. Yeah. So yeah, there were um, a lot of prior questions and then sort of things to respond to here. Arturo, did you want to start or do you want me to start? Why don't you start, Michal? And okay, I will so, try to complement. And Adam, we are how much? What, what's our time now? Very short. <laughs> yeah, about seven. Yeah. Five, right. five, six minutes. Yeah. Five so, minutes. Um, yeah. I um I mean, one of the things that I just, I wanted to name, and there was a question about it earlier about people having like knee jerk reactions to the collective, right? Or to communal. And part of that is like how we've been indoctrinated in Western capitalism that makes us think that like, oh no, we have to have our individual, but part of it. And we were trying to like, this is something we get into in quite depth in, in, um, in our book is there's a difference between the collective seen from the Western onto epistemic perspective we can think state-centered socialism like lose your individuality right like just give everything to the collective versus the relational collective right in which you know you could think of the three sisters as a metaphor right like each one does their part each one has their unique gift to the whole right and that is a different vision of what the collective and interdependence looks like and so part of what it means to start speaking the language of relationality is to find the ways in which the Western onto, ontological framework sort of creeps in and sometimes like makes us veer off the path of the relational, which isn't as formulaic, right? In the sense of like what the old left might've argued or what the values of giving up yourself might have looked like in a, in a previous iteration of the collective, for example. And that's partly why we also talk about decommunalizing, like the verb of it, right? It's never fixed and it never looks one way everywhere. That's just something I wanted to start with. Maybe in following from that, there was a comment in the chat about how do we make it personal and real? How do we make the insights of interdependence and relationality, personal, real, and effective forces in, in, in transformation? And one of the concepts that we use in our book is that we are actively being produced as non-relational entities. We call that the, 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 the production the of non-relationality. Non, the active production of non-relationality. So we are actually being produced as individuals. So the exercise in the first breakout room about thinking about our day from the time we get up to the time we go to bed in terms precisely as of how we are active in producing individuals as separate individuals. How is separation embedded and acted through the designs in which we participate willingly or not become what we, we are enmeshed in these designs. From the time we get up in our home in an individual room, individual house, individual apartment, water, to the time we go to the office or being in front of the computer for eight hours, whatever it is, we are actually produced actively as non-relational entities. So it takes experimentation, it takes observation, and it takes collective work, doing it with others and doing it in practice to rebuild, reconstruct different kinds of more communal ways of being or more collective ways of being. And that leads to the second comment that I want to make very briefly, which is it is true, there was a comment in the chat about uh, communities being, I think Michal was talking about that as well, being negatively looked at, negatively seen, that's something that is cult-like. We can reverse the picture and say that it is the individual that is a cult-like uh, ontology or concept or practice. We have this cult of the individual and has been profoundly damaging to the earth and to each other. 
So we have to produce a new ways of thinking about communities, a new ways of constructing communities, wherever we are. And for each locality is going to be different, for each group of people it's going to be different. So thank you again. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to, I know you all wanted to close up. I can do the reading now or if we have time after. What did you all Please want go to ahead. do? The Thanks. reading? Yeah. All great. right. So I'm going to just close with a couple of passages from the book. Um, very short because of time. And this part comes from a section actually written by our author that's not here today. And I just wanted to have her voice present. Although most of the writing has gotten like that. So writing towards and about this transition between different types of being is difficult, largely due to hybridity. If it was about making a logical argument that is intelligible and persuasive to a liberal Eurocentric modern subject, we could try to do that though there are of course limits to persuasion and how many people for how long have attempted to make this type of man listen to reason, so to speak, using the language he ostensibly ought to understand. And if it was about speaking to and thereby adding to the collective field of courage, life and love that black and indigenous feminists are already creating at the shoreline of reason in the black of the unknown, we may not, we may not be writing in prose at all. And so for whom do we write? For the hybrid, that is, all of us variously mixed in proportions and degrees. And then I'll end with a quote that was really illuminating for us when we found it. Some of you might be familiar with it. Some of you might not, but it comes from someone we all are definitely familiar with, Martin Luther King Jr., who has one of the most profound definitions of relationality and speaks to its political and spiritual dimensions. In a sermon that he gave on Christmas Eve in 1967, he wrote, or he said, all life is interrelated, and we are all caught up in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. I can never be what I ought to be until you are, until you are what you ought to be, and you can never be what you ought to be until I am what I ought to be. This is the interrelated structure of reality. Thanks. Thank you both. Uh, before we close, I'm just going to guide us through a brief integration exercise so that we can tune in and connect and make sure that everything we've learned here today sticks with us. So go ahead and close your eyes once again if that feels okay for you. And just check in with how you're feeling in this moment. Notice if you're feeling differently from how you were when we started. And what's percolating inside of you? What's been stirred? What thoughts or ideas are echoing in your mind? And I invite you to think of one action that you could take this week, maybe that came from your conversation in your last breakouts around how you can integrate one of the axes into your life and work. And see if you're ready to make a commitment to take that action so that you can take this learning and create a ripple effect in your own community. And if there is something that you're ready to commit to doing, I invite you to open your eyes as you're ready and write that commitment in the chat so that it can be witnessed here in community with everyone. Um, and it seems like a, a perfect way to model what Mikhail was just saying about, you know, being ourselves in community and the gift that that is and the role that each of us plays. So thank you all for joining us today. We hope that you will get to be with us for our last conversation on the 16th with Rebecca Henderson um, exploring regenerative leadership. So it's gonna be a great way to close it out. We hope you'll get to be there with us. Thank you uh, to RSA for co-hosting this with us, Adam for taking the lead on our side, and of course to Arturo and Mikel uh, for such a lively discussion and for all of you for being here with us and sharing your insights and wisdom. Thanks so much, May. Adam, Josie, Michal, everybody else. Thank you all. I don't want to put my speaker on because the dogs, but they're thanking you all. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Thanks, everyone.